Welcome everyone. Uh, we are very grateful to have Audra Gezunas here. Um, she is the owner of Brood for Her Ledger LLC, um, which is a management consultancy firm that's focused on providing guidance in the craft alcohol community. She's currently the CFO at Crooked Stave. Um, she's been there for 2000 and for a few years. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, prior to owning her own company, she served as Dogfish Head's controller um, from 2009 to 2010, and then also Mother Earth Brewing's CFO for 2011 to 2014. She has been working exclusively in the craft beer industry for 14 plus years um, and joined the Brewers Association Finance Committee in January 2020. She is a graduate from Ken and Flagler One MBN MBA program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Ooh, yes. <laughs> uh, perfect. Um, and Audra possess possesses 20 plus years experience in senior leadership roles in craft brewing, manufacturing, services, not, pro not for profits, and startups. Um, she's earned her undergraduate degree in accounting and business management, a double major, um, from Loris College in Dubuque, Iowa, in 1997. Yeah, so, <laughs> welcome, Audra. Thank you, Dawn. I appreciate it. It's so good to be back, everybody. This is my third year in a row teaching New York State, and every year a different type of accounting, financial topic that seems to be the most relevant. Um, I was talking to Bart. Uh, our keynote tomorrow, Bart Watson, and I was at the Wyoming Brewers Conference and asked him, you know, what are you seeing within the industry that we're lagging behind as brewers? What where, where are some of the most significant issues that we're seeing? And he said, you know what, brewers still don't really understand how to cost out their beer or how much their beer truly costs. When I started Dogfish Head in 2008, I purposely took a beer vacation up to the Pacific Northwest within the first month of my working at Dogfish. Ran a car, had no agenda, drove around the circle from Seattle all the way up Oregon, all the way up to BC, and back and visited every single brewery and brew club I could to really truly gain an understanding of how a developed market costs out through beer, really understanding how they run operations, because we're a little bit lagging behind on the East Coast at that point in time, and what kind of financial leadership I provide. And lo and behold, about nine out of 10 breweries out there couldn't tell me how much one pint of beer costs either, how much one cake costs. They knew they had cash in the bank, they were surviving, they could pay for their bills, but when it came to, here's the, how much this pint is, nobody could have an answer, like nine out of 10 times. It was remarkable to me. Flash forward, now from 2008 to today, you still have this as an issue, regardless of the fact that we have inventory management software. We have, you know, before, when I traveled around, we didn't have oh, even beer back then. And then Ethos came to market later, followed by Beer 30 and now Ali Alps. None of these applications had existed, so it made sense that we didn't have an idea of how much our beer cost back then, but we're still seeing that as an issue today. So I wanted to put together this talk to really show you and walk you through my methodology and how I cost out beer in the absence of accounting systems and inventory management systems, but also something that you work alongside your inventory management system that you do have to make sure, it's a check and balance, to make sure things are rolling up correctly. But the other thing is that we've always had such a focus on the past and our past performance, our past financials. How did we do over this last month? What does our balance sheet look like now as a result of all our activities leading up to now? But nobody's really focusing on the future. Projections, if you try to use QuickBooks for your projections, good luck. <laughs> and your cash flow projections, forecast looks weird and wonky because it's not made for our industry and not made with how our cash flow cycle works. So I decided, you know, we, we need to have something that we can work alongside our inventory management systems in order to give us a better line of sight, not just to how, our beer, how much our beer costs, but are we pricing things correctly? This theme of this entire conference is sustainability, and I wanted to show you, and this is what I'm gonna take you through, is a lot of math in today's session, of how I've developed 
pretty complex financial models. They'll all be up here in these slides, um, and the deck will be available for everybody's use after, after the uh, presentation as well. My, con uh, my contact information is also on the slides, so reach out to me afterwards. But, uh, so taking a step back, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna go through a little bit of agenda what we're gonna go through today. We're gonna go through the differences between financial and managerial, which is also known as cost accounting. Two completely different areas of accounting, oftentimes they get blended together, and it can be confusing if you're not a non, if you're a non-financial person. So, and then I'll let, go in a little bit deeper on the managerial cost accounting side, and the four types of costs that a brewery will encounter. We'll look at cost components per product, and then we're gonna look at a closer deep dive into overhead. There's a lot on these slides that I, you can just read after the fact. I wanna make sure that you have it there as a future reference point. So we'll go through some of these, skim through them. Then we get to the math part, my favorite part. I'm gonna take you through a managerial accounting approach in how to develop and, um, and calculate overhead per gallon per barrel produced, and then how that slots into your bill of materials. Because ultimately we wanna be able to create a cost roll up of direct materials per barrel produced, direct labor per barrel produced, and overhead per barrel produced. That total all in cost is going to show us what our operating model is, then we look at how much revenue per barrel we're making. Are we making any profit? Are we making any margins? So, and then I'll show you an innovative way to look at in um, costing as to, well, maybe we're kegging this beer right now or we're self-serving over the tap room. Should we can it? Does it make financial sense for us to put it in cans now? Because it's wildly successful. A very pragmatic model and they'll take you through whether it makes sense or not. Then I'm going to step back and, and fly in some financial accounting in there as well. So there'll be a target, um, a hybrid approach of both managerial cost accounting topics flown into your financial accounting, financial statements, your income statement and cash flow for the purpose of you being able to project forward 12, 24, 36 months. Are, are the beers that we're selling in the current mix that we're selling them by package type, does it make financial sense for me align with my goals over what I want to accomplish with the brewery in the next one to three years? How much cash will I have in the bank at the end of 36 months if I'm completely just working as is, no additional changes to my economic model whatsoever? Am I gonna run out of cash? Am I good? Does it make sense for me to purchase this piece of equipment in eight months or do I wait until month 18? That's what this talk is. It is about looking from a future perspective, projections, and um, showing you how you can affect those numbers yourself. So super pragmatic, but also very mathematical heavy. <laughs> so starting out with some differences, main differences between managerial and financial accounting. Financial accounting, those statements, your, your balance sheet, your cash flow, your statement of cash flows, those are uh, typically created for both internal but external parties as well who make those financial decisions for you. Your bankers, your regulatory agencies, your investors. Versus managerial accounting, that type of information is used for managers who are planning for and controlling breweries' day-to-day -day operations. You're the ones that are making those decisions. You're on the floor every day. You can make quick decisions. Managerial accounting approach is what you should be looking at. Financial accounting, as I mentioned, takes largely a historical perspective. Managerial looks into the future. Are we moving in the right direction? What sort of changes do we have to make to our recipes? How about our labor structure and so on? Financial emphasizes verifiability, precision. The primary focus is on the entire brewery as a whole, and it must follow generally accepted accounting principles. We have setups, how things are laid out, how things are reported, we accountants have to follow generally accepted accounting principles to the T for financial accounting purposes. Managerial accounting on the other side, it is emphasizing relevance for planning and timeliness for you to make the decisions that you need to now for the future of the brewery. And it focuses on segments of the brewery. So production, sales, how those fuse together. Does it make sense for us to create a brand new marketing arm for the business, given what our financial situation is now. This is the type of 
a situation that managerial accounting makes more sense to. And it does not have to follow the gap. What you come up with as your own methodology is what's right for the brewery, your economic model. There could be pieces that are gap compliant, but they don't, it doesn't have to follow gap as long as you are consistent and it gives you the economic information you need to make your day-to-day -day decisions. So why understand it? Because we're using it to reduce and eliminate costs within the brewery, but we're also using it to determine a price for our beer that is also gonna allow us to earn a reasonable profit. So following the market, pricing to the market is only one small piece of that puzzle. <clears throat> so the first step that I like to do is knowing and categorizing all the costs that a brewery encounters. When you're looking at your income statement, you have all of your line items there, and there are four types of costs that a brewery encounters. Direct costs, indirect costs, fixed costs, and variable costs. Those are the four categories. So every cost can be defined by two of those four costs. So every cost is gonna be either direct or indirect, and it is going to be fixed or variable. So direct, it can be directly traced to the product, to the batch. You have your bill of materials for your IPA, for your Kolsch, and there's your recipe. Your uh, flavor, how many hours did it take a to brew this beer, to sell this beer, to package this beer? That's direct flavor. Indirect costs can't be directly traced to the product of the batch, so they're allocated. So water condition, um, any sort of supplies that you're using within the brew house, cleaning supplies. From the labor perspective, a managerial role within the brewery, somebody that isn't necessarily brewing the beer, but is overseeing the you know, entire operation. That's indirect. And then there's fixed or variable. So fixed doesn't vary with the level of production, something like the lease on the building, your insurance, whether you're producing zero barrels or 2,000 barrels, that number stays the same. And the variable does change with the level of production. So that is going to be your supplies, your maintenance costs, repairs. Higher the production, the higher that number. <laughs> vice versa. So as, uh, what I like to do as a first step is I take my income statement out and I look at every single cost that I have on my income statement and I'm going to direct and I'm going to label it as direct or indirect and fixed or variable. So D, I, F, B, look at it from each line perspective and know that there are some that are hybrid costs as well. So you'll have like a line cost utilities, for example, you're going to incur a certain cost regardless of the level of usage, and then there will be a level of usage as well. So there can be two components, and there are there's some exceptions to that rule. But in general, what I'm trying to do here is get you in the mind frame of what should be categorized as overhead. What's overhead? What is my fixed overhead? So regardless of the level of production, what are these indirect costs that I'm incurring within the brewery that I need to make sure I'm covering every single month with my level of sales and how I'm selling the beer? That is where I want to get you to. So the cost components per product, direct materials, direct labor, and overhead. Here's a nice little definition of overhead. I'm not going to read it for you. I can read it off the slides and later on. But in short, it's something that you have to pay on an ongoing basis regardless of whether you're doing a high or low volume of business, it can't directly be traced to the product, but it is a cost that you have to incur to keep your lights on, to keep your operation going. So the overhead expenses themselves can be fixed or variable. Uh, fixed overhead, for example, will be same month to month, such as rent. The variable overhead expenses will increase or decrease depending on the business's level of activity, shipping, mailing, logistics, all of like, the shrink wrap that you put around all the cases of beer before you ship it out to your wholesaler. Um, but then overhead expenses can also be semi-variable, as I mentioned. So a lot of those utility costs, you're going to have semi-variable with a component existing as a base and the ranger being on usage. My guidance for this is how material is that to your overall model? Like if you're going to be looking at a difference of $20 when you're all overhead costs as a pool are like 58 to 100,000, just stick to one or the other. You don't have to get super, super nitty gritty with it, but be consistent. So then, 
how do we calculate overhead? And so what I typically like to do is I'm going to, now that I know what my bucket of costs are, I know my fixed rent versus variable, I know my indirect versus direct, now I'm going to pick out all those items that are overhead. They cannot be directly traced to that particular batch of beer. And I typically start this, if a brewery's never done this before, by looking over the previous 12 months. So a year's worth of activity. So I found some of these cost buckets to be like rent, common area maintenance, taxes, insurance, liability insurance, utilities, repair supplies, indirect payroll, for example, an inventory analyst. They're on the floor. They're the ones that are looking at variances. They're helping out the accounting team, but they're also helping out our logistics team. But I can't trace them back to any sort of batch of beer. They're part of overhead too. So a lot of indirect payroll also is included in here. And depreciation within our equipment. I sum up those overhead costs that the brewery has incurred over the last year, and then I choose what my activity driver is. It can be barrels produced. I like to go all the way down to gallons produced because I have to pay my excise tax to my state agency based on gallons that I've sold, removed for consumption or sale, correct? It's not on the barrel level. So I'm breaking it down to the lowest common denominator. You can always roll it back up to barrels later on. So in this example, this brewery that I've been working with, Catamount Ill Works, I had to say that because uh, University of Vermont, I teach a lot from the University of Vermont, and because I live in Western North Carolina, I live in Asheville, North Carolina, by the way. West uh, WCU is also Catamount, so they're the only two Catamounts that I'm aware of in the country. So anyway, Catamount Ill Works is our brewery that I'm using as an example. Catamount, excuse me. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> so 1,500 barrels for this brewery, which I have translated into 46,500 gallons. So when I look at my total pool for the year of overhead costs that I have incurred and divide it by the gallons produced, I'm coming up with a $2.33 rate overhead per gallon. So keep that in mind, 233, because it is a cost that I have to incur Regardless of the level of production, but I also want to include that within my bill of materials when I'm making strategic decisions for the brewery. So first step, calculate what that overhead is. After you've done it and looked at it and have an idea of what it's been over the last year, then you can start incorporating, hey, price increases, and I'm going to have insurance and rent, 3 or 5%, and so on. You can then start changing it to be more forward-looking, but you have to know where you currently sit before you do that. So typically starting point, previous 12 months. Once I get comfortable with that, I typically recalculate overhead on a quarterly basis, not more often than that, because it can get very laborious, especially with timing of journal entries and things like that. But at the very minimum, I would update overhead once a year. So we know, overhead rate, 233 a gallon. This next slide, it's got small print, small print, but it is gonna be on the deck and I wanted to take you through a bill of materials and what that looks like when I create one in Excel. So the top section, that's my recipe. This is my IPA, this is my recipe for a seven barrel batch. So all the malt that I'm using, all the hops that I'm using, so that I know what my total cost is going to be, 841.25, for that particular seven barrel batch of beer. Then I also have my direct labor component. Here's my brew labor of Andrew, who spent five hours brewing that beer. As we're pulling through the packaging side, Roy was cellaring it and packaging it. He spent two hours here, and then um, my cellarman also spent a couple hours there. So I have a direct labor component also. What I'm flying in now into my bullet materials is this overhead line item based on the seven barrel batch, that $233 rate that I'm putting in there. So that I have an all in cost of what it looks like from the brewery's perspective for me to create this beer to make sure that I'm pricing things appropriately. So I have my direct materials for that batch that I've calculated down to the gallon and to the barrel. In this case, it's $120.18 per barrel produced. Direct materials, ingredients. Then I know what my direct labor is going to be per gallon and per barrel produced. And there's that overhead, 233, that I scale up to that seven barrel batch. So that per barrel, is the sum of these three components that is telling me, based on the current cost structure of my brewery, this is my total cost to produce this beer. 
then I can compare my revenue per barrel to see how close I am in hoping that I'm making money on it, but also meeting at least the minimum uh, gross profit, net income, both combination, actually, but net income, and, make, and then making a profit. That is the quick and dirty side of it, but this is a managerial accounting approach. So this is entirely managerial accounting. I'm like creating basically a P&L based on my direct materials, my direct labor and overhead to see which recipes are making more beer, which are making less beer, and am I pricing things appropriately when I include overhead in that calculation? It's one of the biggest mistakes we make as an industry. We're creating our bill of materials, we're looking at our ethos, we're looking at our inventory management systems. Got the direct costs in there, got our the recipe in there. Could even pull in the, the direct labor, because we're pulling it out of payroll, we could have in the cost of goods line item all of our production labor there. But all that overhead is showing up in SG&A and the income statement kind of forgotten about. And so this forces us back into a mentality of, based on my current operating structure, have I priced my beer appropriately, taking everything into account? You can't just depend on your inventory management software as a standalone. It's not enough. We need to have a greater understanding of where our overhead is, how we incur it, and how much of an effect it has on cash flow. Because it has a lot. And I'm seeing breweries starting to really struggle as a result of not understanding what their fixed overhead is. That amount, regardless of level of production, that they're going to have to pay every single month. So bill of materials, how it slots in after we calculate overhead, <coughs> that's the next step. So I know now that direct materials per barrel produce is 120, my direct labor is at 80 something, and then uh, 70 something for overhead. Okay, cool, have that information in mind. So I've been pouring this, tap, uh, this IPA or in the tap room for a period of time now, and I want to can it. Does it make sense for me to can it? How should I take a look at this from this perspective? Knowing now my overhead rate's 233 a gallon, my direct labor and my direct materials are at those rates. I've created this little table. <laughs> and for me, when I create tools for my brewery partners, input cells are blue. So you can change that to be whatever you need to. Those are the areas that you make the inputs. I create all the formulas that are behind the scenes that do all my other fancy math stuff. <clears throat> so I want to see if I, I want to can this beer, if it makes sense for me to can this beer. What I typically start out with is what my target four pack, I'm going to assume target four pack 16 ounce cans, uh, to the consumer is going to be. What I want the consumer to pay. And I've also included a layer of wholesale sales in here sometimes when you're just selling directly through the tap room and in many states bypass this wholesale piece and you recognize that margin yourself as a brewery but I want to put it layer in as much complexity from the very beginning so that we have a full understanding of how the cost gets stripped back from step to from step to step so $15.99 so I roll that up to what a case price of that would be I take away what my normal retail margin is so that's a blue cell typically 25% very common you can change it to 20, you can change it to 30, whatever you want it to be. And then what my target wholesale price is going to be as a result of that, then I take out my wholesale margin. So that is also very standard, 30%. Um, so the facts in then, all right, target lading cost, with, it's FOB with New York excise tax and freight included. I've got New York state excise tax per case in here. And then the freight is the only kind of unknown that you have to calculate on your own. Figure out what your freight cost is going to be from point A to point B into a case equivalent type of basis. That's really kind of behind the scenes type of work that you'd have to do. It does vary very much from different parts of the country that I've found. But you want to put the freight in there as well. And then this is the fun one too. What's your minimum gross profit margin that you want to make as a brewery, as a supplier? Put in there anything you want. See what see what see what happens. <laughs> and in this case, my brewery needs to make at least 35% gross margin. Gross margin being revenue less cost of goods. That's my gross margin. So when I'm switching back over the income statement, that financial accounting mentality, I am looking at revenue less cogs. 
Okay, that's my gross margin. So a minimum of the gross margin is made, the gravy is made because this percent is supposed to technically uh, support your overhead. <clears throat> so for you to break even, let's say my overhead rate is 35% of all total sales, that's my number to hit to break even. But you can put in any number that you want in there. So let's start with 35%. From that, I have my target cost of goods per case that includes federal, state excise, packaging labor, everything. Then I take out the excise taxes, the labor and overhead per case cost, and packaging per case cost. This, uh, the labor piece you get out of your payroll reports. And then the packaging, I like to point everything, because this changes, <coughs> our inputs on the canning side change as we work from different canning suppliers. So I kept those blue. And then finally, what my expected yield is going to be for that particular style of beer. I recognize 85% is aggressive for an IPA. A lot of us incur greater losses than 15% on those, but let's say hopefully uh, 85% is my yield. So when I work that all the way back into but my answer is, that's my target ingredient cost per barrel brew. That's my guidance point that I have. So for me to charge $15.99 to a consumer for this four pack of beer, I need to keep my ingredient cost to $78.38 per barrel brew. Remember what it was in the last slide? $120. So when you recognize what your actual costs are versus what your target costs are, you have some work to do if you want to do this on the IP side. Maybe that's not the decision that you make now. Maybe we switch it to a Hulsh or a Lager. Something that I can hit that 78-38 metric without changing something else fundamentally about my brewery. So I use this for forward making decisions a lot. This can be converted into um, kegs, into six stools and halves, but I find the greatest amount of variability and the greatest amount of momentum and the decisions that breweries choose to make are cans on the can level. So I usually start with this exercise for them. So we either alter a recipe that we want to take away from our special sauce, or we say, you know what, 7838, how much are we making on that rice lager? How much is that costing us? Maybe we can that first, see what the market pull through is, and then come back and revisit when we make a little bit of a higher margin. The other option is, I have gum hole, I'm canning this IPA. I don't care, I, I, don't want, I want to can this. What then happens is that now you know the 12018 target material per barrel fruit is up here. This number, your minimum gross profit margin, drop it, drop it, drop it. The lower you go, the higher this number goes. When you hit that 12018, that's how much of a gross uh, margin you're making for the brewery by choosing to can. Could be 8%, could be five. At least you know what that number is before you make that decision to move forward or not. <laughs> the other thing you can do is you can raise that price. It doesn't have to be 15.99, it could be 17.99, it could be 18.99. Everything else remaining the same, that number will also go up. So your two main levers to push within this model is going to be your price, the top one, and your gross profit margin. Play with both of those until it hits what your target ingredient cost per barrel is. And see if you're happy with that. If you're not, move on to another beer. Don't can't. So some costing, um, cost accounting, common cost accounting formulas that I work within our industry. Uh, break even, gross margin, which we already talked about, sales less cost of goods and then net income. People confuse gross margin, net income, EBITDA, all those numbers a little bit together. Um, I'll read a little bit through those means when we walk into the next part of the math piece, which you just be like, <laughs> there's more. <laughs> there's much more to come. Now, the break even is the one that I really want to focus on. So the break even formula is the point of where my sales, less all my variable costs, less all my fixed costs is zero. That's it. That's my break even. So you can rearrange that algebraically where you have sales being S, sales of X, X is being the amount of units that we're going to be solving for, minus variable costs of X, 
what we're solving for, minus fixed costs for where it would get to zero and actually the number of units uh, that we're selling. In this case, we're going to be cases. And this gave you a little methodology behind it that you can read later on. So we have uh, three. We're selling the cases of beer for $36. Our rent at 1,000 utilities, 12, 215. The cost for the case in the barley in the house is three, packaging is two, excess tax is 50 cents, and labor is two. First thing I do is I separate out what my fixed costs are apart from my variable costs. So my two fixed costs are going to be my rent and utilities. Those do not change with the level of production. I still have to pay the same amount regardless. Versus my direct material, my barley hops, packaging, excise tax, and labor. Those do vary with the level of production. So those are my variable costs. So I then create this formula. <coughs> create this formula with my sales price, 36 of x minus the sum of my variable cost per case, which is 750, barley house packaging, excise tax, and labor, minus the 12.50, the two um, fixed costs that we have. That's zero. So then we combine those together. We move the 12.50 over here, doing some fun uh, junior high algebra. I love algebra, by the way. It's fun. Mm -hmm. And then you divide 1250 by the 2850 to solve for x. And our break even for this particular brewery model is 43.86 <coughs> or 44 cases. That's what we need to sell in order to break even based on our current operating structure. Very, very simple example, but the methodology should be the same. And that's how you think through um, your cost structure should be the same regardless of the size and the complexity of the brewery. Look at your fixed costs, look at your variable costs, know what your sales price is for that particular <clears throat> item, solve for X, and that'll tell you what your break-even point is going to be. That's a break-even point, but when I work at breweries, I like to come up with a break-even range. So break-even range, if I'm looking at what my five top cent selling styles of beer are, if I sold 100% rice lager and nothing else, one of my lowest costs to produce a beer, what is my break-even point then? On the other hand, what if I sell 100% of all this triple hop hazy that I've produced? My most expensive beer that I have. So you're gonna have a different break-even point there. So break-even range is gonna be in between those, and then your job as brewery owners is to come up with what that right mix is in between for me to hit my particular financial goal. So break-even point it is not a drop dead thing for a brewery. We come up with what a range is, and then we have the power and control to determine what that mix is by style to get us to where we need to be financially. So, hiring. Working in some of this managerial cost accounting concept, and we're into a financial accounting model. The first thing I do is I look at what my goal is going to be over the upcoming 12 months. Remember, we were producing 1,500 barrels this year. I would say 1,850 for the upcoming year. For 2023, I want to produce 1,850. I also, we're going to see that, you don't see the seasonality factor in here because I have it in a different part of the spreadsheet. But in other words, that's why these numbers are different here um, for the production barrels. I have a seasonality factor that I fly in. I look at my previous 12 months of activity, and if I've been open for two, three years, I'm averaging. What percent of sales in that month uh, account for the total? So if I have 100% sales, it's usually like 5.3% of it was in January, 4.6% was in February. Every brewery has its own seasonality curve. So I work that in there as well um, and include that for my production goals. In Asheville, things slow down a lot for us in January and February. It's a very slow season for us. We're finally emerging out of it now. What, my breweries in Florida, they're booming. They just went through Gasparilla, they just went through Tampa Bay Beer Week. Their dead months are July and August. Nobody's buying beer in July and August because everybody wants to get out of Florida. <laughs> so I have to accommodate that within their respective model. The point being, seasonality is recruiting unique to each area within our country. But having that there is important because we want to have a line of sight as to what our cash flow is going to look like during those lowest lows that we're incurring. 
What are we going to have is the lowest low for the upcoming 12 months to make sure we don't overspend that amount of cash or we have access to a line of credit to be able to survive that dip. So first step, how much do I want to produce in 2023 in, in barrels? <clears throat> fly the season out of the And then I also apply production loss in this column. It's an overall build for the entire brewery. I'm not breaking it down by style. No need to do that quite yet. <laughs> So I can get the yield information for my inventory management software. Ecos, uh, they'll tell me what my yields are for the brewery for a particular time period. So I know what my loss percentage is overall, my current operating model. So the 1850 barrels that I'm planning to produce, I can sell up to 1607, the rest I'm using within the production process. That's my first step. So these numbers, available to sell by month, these will now fly into the meat and potatoes of this model that hopefully may be overwhelming. It is like drinking from a fire hose. I've created this from scratch. <coughs> I did this for creature comforts. My very first contract, back when I started out on my own, when I left Mother Earth, I worked with them for five months as their interim CFO, uh, CEO, until they got started and launched. So for five months, we built a lot of these types of financial predictability models. I've gone through about seven iterations since then. And so what I'm presenting to you today is pretty much the newest version of it. Um, I have that, so the second row, that month one, I don't have a little clicker, but right here. Those are those numbers that were flying in available for sale per month. That is now comprising that total barrels roll row up, up above. From that point, so that's how many barrels I have available for sale. The first thing I want to do is I want to look at and say, okay, I'll move any of the barrels that I'm going to produce. How much of this liquid am I going to allocate by package type? So I have bottles, draft, cans, and six tools. Good starting point. How are things currently selling through? Now, you can use your ecos, you can use your point of sale. Arrive is really good. Dope toast is really good for giving you that sort of data and information by package type, but especially on, I usually use Ecos for you know, my inventory management software as, my, as a scenario. But how much of this, and then I'll take it from there and it can change it. Yeah, blue input cell, you get to change that. So, barrels available for sale, allocated by packaging type. Package type, what it sells. What happens from here is it flies into each one of these packaging types. Total available in barrels by package type. So in other words, if I'm going to allocate 46% of that liquid in month one of the 84 barrels, 38.83 is going to be draft. That's the equivalent of my 46%, and so on and so forth. So that's the first step of what happens. From that point, then I look at, OK, I now know that I'm going to plan to sell 733 barrels to the tap room. Does that make sense? Am I overshooting it? Should I sell more? Does it make sense? Like just kind of like doing a little sense check. How much did I sell last year? Is this an attainable goal? From that point then, I look at sales mix. So this is my next column. And it can vary, and it will vary by packaging type. So again, start off with, in creating this exercise, I will look at your arrive data, your point of sale data. How are things currently selling through? And the styles of beer, by the way, that I'm using are the ones that are comprising at least 80% of my total sales. I don't care about that one-off, super long barrel release that counts for like less than a percent of my total revenue. I, I, that's, this is not my growth model. What I'm looking at, what I'm trying to accomplish in the upcoming two, 12 to 36 months these are where I'm going to be placing my focus, not my one single rare barrel, you know, barrel release that I have. So at least 80% of total sales. You don't want to get too caught up in details. I have a side rate that I work with. They were through, <laughs> there were like 37 different varieties that they decided that they wanted to work in because they have to order heirloom apples for each one of those. So they went through that full exercise and built it out for 37 different brands. Do not advise that. You can do it though, because it follows the same logic. So you have your sales mix 
five package type here. Okay, we have that information. Then we fly in what are wholesale and retail pricing. If you have multiple pores in the tap room, such as Kettle Mount Millworks, I am looking at five ounce, 12 ounce, and 16 ounce pores. Not every one column has to have a, a number in it, but what if you distribute, just distribute to other states and have a different pricing tier in those different states? You can certainly utilize that column for a different pricing tier as well. But in this case, wholesale price, retail price, cans, six bottles, bottles, I'm going to input all those numbers myself. The cost column comes from my inventory management system. That's already all there. So I'm just pulling that in there. It's going to be updated once a year. You're, you're good to go. I have a whole bunch of math in these cells that basically converts based on the sales mix and the barrels allocated uh, what that unit is going to be. So it's the number of units. So everything is looking at a barrel equivalent, so how many pints are there in a barrel? How many sickles are there in a barrel? How many half barrels are in a barrel? So you'll see two, six, those types of number, no, type of numbers. So that you get those white cells in that section are, are units. And I look at it, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna look for any kind of inconsistencies, like one number being way off than another one. Look for any errors in formulas. Everything looks pretty consistent here. And then, what this does, this is basically the meat and potatoes of my financial <coughs> projection grid that I'm going to utilize with most of my brewery partners that I work with. I set up and build something that looks very much like this. So they can play with what if scenarios any which way they would like using those blue input cells. The logic behind this is that it'll take, let's take a look at the six holes. This 51 number will take 51. <coughs> Multiply it by the retail price, and then multiply it by the retail percent. So I have also allocated 80% uh, of my wholesale arm of the business through wholesale pricing. The other 20% is going to go through retail. That excludes draft. That doesn't touch any of that formula. You don't have an 80-20 or anything. There's no wholesale pricing on that. So draft is excluded. So I'm looking at six sold cases, bottles. How much is that going through wholesale? How much of it is going through retail from the dollar perspective? So six bills. 51 six bills times 116 times 20% retail price plus 51 six bills times $90 wholesale pricing tier times 80%. And that flows through into your income state. So now we're applying in this managerial accounting piece into our financial accounting piece. So that grid, this grid feeds your financials. Your wholesale arm, your retail arm, by package type, it flows into GAAP compliant financials. So you have your income from the wholesale arm of the business, your income from the retail arm of the business, by packaging type. So that you could then also measure your cost of goods also. You have COGS, that was that red column in the previous uh, slide. So now you know what you have your wholesale arm, your retail arm, by package type. You can include your tap room income, also um, that comes from the out of the previous grid. Kitchen and other things that are like ancillary, I'm just working directly within the P&L for that and then putting those numbers there. <laughs> but you can also create a special or separate creator part for that. So you have your revenue, less cost of goods. Here's my gross margin. What's my gross margin doing? I've now been taking all of my operating expenses. So the income statement is revenue, less cost of goods, gross margin equals gross margin. And then everything below gross margin is sales, general, administrative expenses. For this exercise and for this purpose of predictability, I am totaling them all together because I want to know what my operating model looks like within my brewery as a whole to see how sustainable it is. So my operating expenses are in this line. Uh, incremental personnel, payroll taxes, if I want to add people in the upcoming year, if I want to give people raises, 
if uh, in the state of Colorado, for example, we have a state mandate for wage raises that were went into effect, Julie knows, um, as of January 1st, that I have to bump pretty much everybody's raises and income by another nine and a half percent apart from the review to be compliant with the Colorado standards. So that's where that came in. But in any case, I have, I'm using this grid to create the top part of my income statement. I can manipulate these numbers any which way from the sales mix side, pricing side, for it to flow into the profit and loss statement to play with what if. What if we did this? What if we sold more rice on our side pay? What if we really focused on seltzer this year? What is that going to do? And then you can incentivize your sales team as a result of it because now you have goals that you're working with. And ultimately, why do we want to do this? Cash flow. We want to understand what our cash flow looks like. So when we have a income statement, our EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax, and depreciation, and amortization, also known as net operating income. I don't care about depreciation or interest to spend. These are non-cash items. They have nothing to do with my day-to-day -day operations. I'm focused on EBITDA. The bank is going to be focused on EBITDA. Debt service coverage ratio calculation based on EBITDA. That is that number. Net operating income is what we really want to focus on. So when I look at that number, like, does that make sense? Is that good? Is it bad? It's positive. Where is it? How do we end up as a result of how we're currently modeling things? So you create a cash flow statement, which I taught how to create a cash flow statement last year, which was a lot of fun. Thank you for everybody who attended last year's session. Um, and I, when I create a cash flow statement, I use the indirect method, according to the account, according to generally accepted accounting principles. Because I can assume a certain amount of spend is going to happen with the brewery from month to month, regardless. So this is where that key of understanding what your fixed overhead is. Know what kind of spend and cash outflow you're going to have, regardless of the level of production. Once you know that, you just want to track the changes, those deltas. You might have to spend more this month because I anticipate selling more beer in a wholesale two months from now. So I have to spend more on ingredients than I typically do. Or are we going into a slowdown season so I can start bleeding through that inventory that I currently have and spend less on inventory than, natural, than usual? So an indirect method um, for cash flow statement is measuring the changes from month to month, not the raw inflow and not the raw outflow. I feel using the indirect method, and with my experience over the last 15 years of doing this, indirect method gives you much greater insight and it's a lot easier language to use and digest with brewery owners who do not have a financial background. They see the effect of their behavior, of their actions, of their purchasing activity, of paying things, paying debt off more quickly or more slowly. How does that affect our cash position? So that, that income statement flows into a cash flow that looks like this. My beginning cash number is going to be a reconciled number that I have <coughs> as of 1, 1, 2, 3, in this case 1, 1, 2, 3, but it could be any month. You could start, you know what, uh, we're almost done with the first quarter, how about we create projections for the upcoming 12 months for the brewery and start with April 1st. So this beginning cash number will be as of March 31st, your reconciled cash balance. And then, your, based on your sales, your seasonability curve that you have worked in there, any planned expansion, in this case, Panama wanted to build it in a beer garden, so it's an investing activity for them, that those are the planned payments they're gonna have to make. It will give me a beginning and ending cash balance, and I wanna be able to make sure that this bottom ending cash balance never turns red. At a very minimum, one month of operating expenses are in the bank or if there's less than one, I'm aware of it, because if you run into a negative position, it's not necessarily inherently bad, but it gives you the foresight to say, six months from now, we're gonna run out of cash if we continue to do things the way that we're doing them. We need to change something. It at least gives you time and the foresight to say, it's gonna be month five, it's gonna be month six, urgency, <laughs> time, to, time to snap to it and change something so that we're not caught on. 
So these, um, these statements are available all on the deck. Again, if you have any questions, I know we're getting low on time here too. There's my contact information. Um, when I'm not an accountant, I am a cosplayer. And Star Wars is uh, my favorite to do cosplay. This was me at the CBC last year, walking around the pretty chill floor, and Luke Troutmine took a picture of that and put it up at the put it up on the VA. It was fun. Um, I'm working on a couple of. I'm getting approved to the 501st Legion as Darth Vader. Nerd stuff. I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd both like in professional life as well as social life. So anyway, thank you for attending. I really appreciate it. I have cards too. Please <coughs> reach out if you have questions. Thank you for all this mapping time that you spent with me. And pleasure to be back in New York. Thanks again. Oh, I have a question. Anybody has any questions? We have about five minutes. Sure. I just wanted to ask, we were making a lot of reference to inventory software. I just want to throw out there that there are a lot of breweries that have software as that kind of data necessarily. So when you're working with someone who's pulling from like Let's say Square. I know you mentioned Toast. I would maybe that or that for it. But let's say someone pulls here pulling from Square. Is there anything that, you, that is beneficial to you to be able to analyze their data as far as like how they set up their POS initially? If it's like breaking things down, style the style of beer because I can come up with what that bill of materials is. We can come up with it as a production team. We can do a cost roll like we did just here. The IPA recipe that we looked at. There's no inventory management software there. I work with a lot of startups. We don't have any inventory management software. I'm helping them scale their recipes from a homebrew batch or from a three barrel to a 10 barrel to really like visualize what their future is going to look like. There's no software like that at that point. So what we do is we do a cost roll up from the very ground up, the bill of materials with the, the bottom. And that's, that's my starting point. <coughs> Being able to pull that out of information out of the point of sale is going to help me realize what your weighted average cost of goods is based on how what styles of beer are selling. Because I can get the cost information from your production team, the sales information from Square, but I need to know how what styles are selling. So the product, the style type would be the most important. Pint versus half pint, not really so much. It would be more style specific. And then if you're selling anything through retail kegs and cans, what um, I would look at your invoices for your cans and your like, yeah, exactly. It can be done without inventory management software, without a doubt. I've done it many times. So, yeah. Is there like a certain way of structure that it easier for you? By every modifier, yeah. Like so, if you do have pours, I just like them by by product style. It doesn't have to be the name of the beer. I would rather be focused on the style because that goes back to the recipe. Name it something because you change some one hop out versus another. If it's still yeah, like it's a simple hop. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I'm the cost is going to be relatively the same. The difference comes like, oh, I'm going to use cryo hops now instead. All right, let's take a look at that as a separate category because that it could impact it quite a bit. Very recipe cost, but yeah, style. Yes. Yeah, so when you were computing the overhead to be calculated in the cost of, of the beer, that was just the overhead for the production facility. So, you got a tap room or other areas? I can general, but I can do production and general. So overhead can be general as an overall operation because a lot of times, especially smaller breweries, the tap room is an essential piece of their operating right. model. Right. So I'm looking at it overall. Okay. And then once I get comfortable with general overhead at that 233 rate, then I can break it apart, production overhead, and then general administrative or tap room overhead. That can separate out by square footage or by specific use. That can also be done. But I didn't want to drive too much complexity in the hour that we had. But yeah, you can separate it out, absolutely, and I encourage it. Yes. When you're figuring out labor as a direct cost, let's say you have four brewers on the floor and two of them are canning one product and two are brewing, but it's kind of everybody working together. Is there a good way to really like dial down per beer what that is without sitting there and, and 
monitoring I, it? I would use the average amount of time per cycle, per pro, like per product. So knowing that if you're kettle souring, I say that, yeah, kettle souring, <laughs> uh, you, and you have an additional process that has to take place prior to that, it's going to be different than like a normal iPad or normal full script. Having the amount of time being spent is fine. With an average wage rate, is fine. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, you don't have to get very, very specific. Okay. Correct. Materials like the, it's a cellaring time, it's hard to tell in here, but I do have cellaring hours on that. But I also look at the overall average because I think every single beer does require a level of care. That even though it's indirect and a large piece of it, we can say, like, on average, it takes us an hour or two hours to sell in this beer to fruition. And so I wanted to include that in there. Does that answer your question? Yeah. It's very hard to get it specific because getting people, like keeping people accountable for a logging time, this makes me like, go back to nightmarish flashbacks to my public accounting days when I had to like mark every single project that I spent every 15 minutes on. Yeah, I'm talking about the, the, the labor. Yeah. I'm talking about the, the tanks. Like, oh, all the tanks, the occupancy. Yeah. Yeah, so we yes. sort of brewed two wheels, two wheels. Yeah, you can certainly work that in there. I don't have that in there. How do you do that? Um, I mean, I do, so opportunity cost. So I look at, you know, if, if I have a faster turning ale that I could put in that tank versus a slower moving lager, like it's gonna take me 36 days in this lager and I can put two, uh, two ales through, I'm looking at the profit margin that is lost by having that um, lager sitting in the tank, this lager. I'm looking at it from, uh, from the opportunity cost perspective. And I think you can also. There's multiple ways to do it. There's not one. Necessary. Yeah, like for like the when you're projecting how many barrels you're gonna have in one year. You know, if you have your schedule and you know what you want to do, and you know that okay, this thing is gonna be this many barrels, but I'm gonna have it. Yeah, and then you can also look at the opportunity cost of having that barrel in the tank. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.